So then, we're going to take a look at the passage that we read earlier. And the passage was the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, chapter 13. Uh, do you know, a lot of my friends recently were talking about this, and they were absolutely amazed that there were 13 chapters in 2 Corinthians. Uh, but none of them were able to tell me anything about what it says in any of the chapters. Funny, isn't it? Um, one of the Second Corinthians is the second letter. It's actually the fourth letter altogether, but it's the second letter that he, that's recorded for us. And a great deal of what's said in that chapter, people don't know about. But we're going to look at it together. We're going to look at it verse by verse, and we're looking at it sentence by sentence. More importantly, and as we go through it sentence by sentence, I think we will all be encouraged today, and we will all be enlightened. So in the first 10 verses of the last chapter 13, Paul brings his long letter to an end by saying, I will visit you again soon for the third time. Now, verse 1, he says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Um, the first time that he visited them was when he stayed there for quite a long time, about two years, in which he established the church the second time was when he revisited the church years later um, and helped to, helped to um, establish the church even more and help them to appoint elders and various other issues in the church. And the third time is going to be hopefully a peaceful pastoral visit. Uh, Paul says hopefully it's going to be a peaceful pastoral visit because there's certain issues that I hope that you will have been put right before I come. Okay, And then in verse 2 he says in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word will be established. You know the Apostle Paul uh, was not going to listen to gossip. Very important that we don't listen to gossip. None of us should listen to gossip. We shouldn't listen to what you would call hearsay. Hearsay is, oh, well, did you hear what so-and-so said about so-and-so and what they heard about so-and-so that they heard about what so-and-so said? No, that's not. That's not. That's just gossip. That's just where something goes around the reeking, as they say in Shropshire. And by the time it reaches you again, it's a completely different story. You've all heard of Chinese whispers where the story completely changes after a little while. Well, Paul says, I'm not going to listen to gossip. And I'm also not going to jump to rash conclusions and judgments. It's very easy, you see, especially in church life, to jump to conclusions. You hear something and you think, oh, that's bad. Ah, no, hang on a minute. That may not be all the story. Okay? So Paul says, look, when I come, okay, I will want to hear everything by actual witnesses. People who actually saw things done and people that actually heard things firsthand, what was said. And I'm not just going to listen to one witness. I want to listen to three or four. Ideally. Two at least. Three, great. Four, even better because every word is confirmed by two or three witnesses now in the lifetime of the Lord Jesus and in the Lord of Moses this was an established fact nothing was ever established in law without two or three witnesses this is why when the Lord Jesus sent out the disciples he had 12 disciples didn't he he sent them out in pairs if you go through the record you'll discover that whenever you have the list of the disciples mentioned and it's recorded on three occasions you'll find that they're always in pairs Peter and John okay and so on they're always recorded in pairs and you say well is that just convenience was it just so they could have a nice chat along the way no it wasn't for that reason at all they were always recorded in pairs because when they went to preach the gospel every word that they spoke had to be confirmed by another witness it wasn't just one person, it was always two. Okay, and um, in, the, in the old Lord of Moses, if somebody was convicted of a crime, it couldn't just have one person that would testify. There would have to be at least two that would testify, because the judgments that are going to be made are quite serious. See, and two witnesses was very important. Now remember with the trials of the Lord Jesus, when he went to trial, he went to five trials in the end, and it says about those trials that they couldn't find any witnesses to agree. See that? 
So they brought lots of witnesses. The trouble is the witnesses didn't agree with each other. And if witnesses don't agree with each other or contradict each other, then somebody's not telling the truth. You see the point? Only when people could agree can the truth be established. And of course, in the Christian church, um, Paul went out always with a partner, sometimes with more people there too. So in the beginning of Paul's work, it was always Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. And when Barnabas decided to work separately to Paul, then it was always Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas. See the point? But there were others in the team too. Luke was there always. Uh, Timothy was often there. Titus was often there too. And there's a great principle here that actually every word needs to be established with more than one person. Now when we come to verse 2 and 3, we'll see that that's just sentence number 2. He says, I told you beforehand, and I'm going to tell you again, uh, and if I am present the second time, um, I will then explain all these things again. He says, when I come next time, the third time, I will not spare Paul had given this church a lot of opportunity to change. A lot of opportunity. His first letter was a bit stinging in rebuke. And he says, if you haven't changed, then I'm afraid I'll, I won't spare you next time. I'll have to come with the full weight of my apostolic authority. So he says, I've mentioned this before and now I tell you this before I arrive, as if I was already with you. He says, I'm writing to those who have sinned in the church and to everybody else uh, that if I have to come in a spirit of judgment, okay, then I will not spare people who are sinners and I will use my full apostolic authority. Now, we need, we need to just think carefully about what Paul is saying here. First of all, I was talking to somebody a couple of days ago and we mentioned we've had conversations since and he was saying, oh, anybody can be an apostle. Said, no? What do you mean anybody can be an apostle? Oh yes, anybody can be an apostle. Anybody can speak in tongues. Anybody can heal anybody. Anybody could be a pastor. Anybody can be a prophet. And I said, no, just, a, just a minute now, just a minute now. Not everybody that was a disciple of Christ was an apostle. Were they? And I challenged this guy. I said, is everybody in your church the pastor? And they went, well, no. I said, but you just said that anybody can be anything. No, that isn't how it is. There are some people that are apostles. There aren't any apostles today, of course, because apostles are in the foundation of the church. You don't have a foundation all the way through the building, do you? Eventually, when you get to the roof, that's not the foundation, is it? So the apostles and prophets were in the foundation of the church. Then you've got elders and teachers. They're the people that build upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Okay? So he says, he says, um, I'm writing to you, he says, because you have questioned my apostolic authority. You see, his own converts, the people at Corinth, have said, well, who does he think he is, this little fella? This fella that doesn't talk very well. This fella's a bit uncouth when he preaches. Oh, he's very knowledgeable, but we don't really like him. He's not very handsome. And he's only a little fella. He's got a bit of a stoop, you know, Paul, Paul has. He says, you've questioned my authority. I've had to be really stupid and defend my authority. I shouldn't have to defend it to you because you're the people that I led to Christ. Why would I have to explain to you that I'm a Christian? I'm the person that helped you to become a Christian. Right. He says, you've questioned my apostolic authority that I speak in the name of Christ, which you think is weak in me. But when I come... It will be powerful towards you. Now, let me just say something. You wouldn't want to meet an apostle. You say, oh, I'd love to meet an apostle. Uh, no, you wouldn't. The apostles had very extraordinary powers. They were able by the Lord to know what you think. They were able by the Lord to know whether you've sinned and you haven't told a soul. 
they would know by the power of the Lord whether you've ever told a lie. Would you want to meet someone like that? Do you know when I was a young Christian, they used to have various evangelists would come to my church to preach. I was frightened to death of them. You know why? Because they were men of God. And they could see right through me. They knew almost what I've been up to. They were men of wisdom. That wasn't just a supernatural gift. That was just experience in their part. These men frightened me and the apostles of the early days frightened people. When Paul went on his first missionary journey, the very first miracle he ever performed was to blind a man that was opposing the gospel. You say, whoa, I thought they, they healed people from blindness. Oh, they did that too. But these were not men to be messed about with. And of course, there are people that are extraordinary today, but not in the apostolic sense. He says in verse 4, he says, For though Christ was crucified in weakness, yet he lives in the power of God. You see, when Christ died on the cross... He died in weakness, didn't he? But we mustn't confuse weakness with powerlessness. The Lord Jesus on the cross, he could have called, he could have called for 50,000 angels to come and deliver him. So the fact that he submitted himself didn't mean he wasn't powerful. But and and is the Lord Jesus Christ weak now? Well, he's not on the cross anymore. No, he's not weak at all. In fact, in his resurrection life, he exercises all the power of Almighty God in the world today. You see, people think of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and so on. Well, when the Lord Jesus was a baby, he was gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But he grew up. And not only did he grow up, but he went to the cross and he rose again. And now he lives in the power of an endless life. And all power and all authority has been given to him. Do you think that he's gentle Jesus, meek and mild now? No, he's not gentle Jesus, meek and mild now. So Paul says in verse 5, he says, I want you to examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Now, I, I was looking at a translation this morning. That's the one that I use a lot. And quite the wrong construction was put on that verse. Quite the wrong construction. What Paul is not saying here is this. He says, I don't want you to examine yourself to see whether you ever became a Christian. I can tell you that you did. I was there. I led you to the Lord. I know you became a Christian. So I don't need you to examine yourself to see whether you had faith. You had faith. No, no. He says, I want you to examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. What's that, you say? What is the faith? Well, the faith is the body of Christian teaching. And you say, well, I, I, I know what the Bible says and all that. No, it's not, it goes beyond that. It's not just about knowing what the Bible says. It's this. It's do you put into action in your life what the Bible teaches? That is the faith. When you go to Titus, Paul's letter to Titus, he's even more forthright. He says that this teaching that we have... This wonderful teaching we have from God is about the holy life that we live. If you don't live that holy life, then you are not in the faith. Then you're not in the faith. That doesn't mean to say you've lost all faith. You'll still be a Christian. But you can be a Christian and be away from the Lord, can't you? We all know that. We all know what that means. So he's not saying, I want you to doubt your faith. That's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying is, I want you to test yourself to see whether what you do matches what you say you believe. That's the test. Now that's a test we all need to face. You see, I'll put it to you kindly like this. I know a lot of you here. You all know me. You say you're a Christian, right? 
Okay? Then do you live as a Christian should live? That's the question, isn't it? See, I see you on a Sunday morning. I know. You all turn up. You put your best tie on. You, well, those of you that wear a tie. You put your best clothes on. You start, sit there and you look sweet and sweetness and light. Little halos above every head. But what are you like on a Monday morning? And what are you like on a Saturday night? Now that's different, isn't it? And you men, what are you like when you're at home alone by yourself? And you women, what are you like when you're out there in, the, in town by yourself? Are you still a Christian then? Is that your faith then? He says, I want to examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. In other words, prove yourselves. It doesn't mean prove yourselves to me. Prove your life. The, the idea of proving something is beautiful. It comes from the kitchen. Isn't it? And you get the dough and you, you put the yeast in it and you... Do all that to it, don't you? I don't know anything about this. I'm just talking at the top of my head here. But you do all that to the dough, don't you? Then you put it in a warm spot. What happens? It proves. What's it prove? What does prove mean? It means it becomes tested to see whether there's really any yeast in it at all. Because if there really is yeast in the bread and it's in a warm place, what will happen? It will multiply. It grows and grows and grows and grows. And you can come back to it and you might see half a dozen of these little loaves. And one of them is a little bit of a little thing in the corner. And you think, well, that didn't have anything in it. There was no yeast in that. I don't know how I missed it. It's a tiny little, it's a tiny little roll that big. But all the rest are nice and big and strong. What has the process done? It has proved what was in it. That's what it's done. It's tested it to see what was in it. All those that had yeast, it rose. But the one that didn't have any yeast, it didn't rise at all. Now let me ask you something. If you were pastor and you looked out on your congregation and you see all the people that have made a profession of faith, let me ask you this. Can you see those whose faith is real? Is it really real for them? Have they ever really grown like the yeast? Or are they still a little tiny little bit in the corner that's got nothing in it? That's the proof. That's the proof. Prove yourselves, he says. Now then, <clears throat> I'm going to say two statements here. First of all, if you say you're a Christian, then do you live as a Christian? That's the first question. The second question is this. If you don't live as a Christian should, then are you a Christian? It's a question, isn't it? For example, if you were the baker and you looked at all your bread and you saw all the lovely large pieces, they've all been proven, they've all grown in size, but there's a little bit of dough in the corner that hasn't risen at all. What's, can, what's that going to tell you? It's going to tell you this. That there was nothing in it. There was nothing in it. Wow. I meet lots of Christians all over the world. I meet lots of Christians every day from every country of the world. And sometimes, sadly, they make a profession. But there's nothing in it. Or they say they're a Christian. But their lives never change. They say they're a Christian, but they never grow. What does that tell you? Does that tell you there was something wrong with them? No, they never had it in the beginning. They never ever came to that moment in their life when they actually believed in Jesus as their saviour. And so because of that they didn't grow, did they? Because they never were there in the first place. Paul says you need to examine yourself. Not in order to doubt whether you're a Christian. You need to examine yourselves to see whether in your Christian life there's ever been any growth. Wow. Verse 6, sorry, verse 5, it carries on. It's sentence number 6. He says, Know ye not yourselves how that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are reprobates. Let me explain what that means. He says, first of all, don't you know yourself? 
One of the most important things we need to do in life is to get to know about ourselves, to find out about ourselves. We just cruise through life never thinking about ourselves, thinking only about other people. He says, get to know about yourselves and do you know that Jesus Christ is in you or not? Right. Unless, he says, you started well but you've turned away from Christ. You failed the test of holiness... Now, you know, at the moment there's a great problem in the United States of a very, very, very well-known pastor who's been discovered to have fallen in sin. This isn't unusual. Put your hand up if you're a Christian that's never sinned. Oh, so you all sin. So do I. We all fall in sin. But his sin is serious, of course. And there's a great inquiry at the moment, and the inquiry is not, was he ever a Christian? That isn't the question. The question is this, he was a Christian, but did he allow his Christian life to grow in holiness before the Lord? And the answer, obviously, is not as much as he could have done. Not as much as it could, that's all. You see, it's possible... To live as a, it's possible to live as a Christian ought to. It is possible to do that. I know lots of people that really live as a Christian ought to live. But it's also possible to be a Christian and to not live as you ought to. Isn't that right? Now let me ask you something. What happens when a Christian doesn't live as he ought to? How I many is he lost? No, he isn't lost. No. Let me ask you a question. Those of you that have got children of your own, do they always live as they ought to? No. Oh, you shook your head. No, they don't. Let me ask you, have you forsaken them then? No. Why not? Because you love them just the same, don't you? The fact that they don't always do what you think would be right, and they probably don't do what is always the right thing to do, but they're still your children, aren't they? Do you think that God has a lower standard than, he, than you? Of course he doesn't. He loves his children more than you'll ever love yours. So then, it's a shame, of course. And there is a way back, but it's still a shame. I've got two girls. Thankfully, they love the Lord. Do you know what? If ever they went away from the Lord, that would be a terrible shame. But I'd still love them just the same. And so it is with the Lord. When a Christian, in the, a young man like this, trusts the Lord and everything else, and in later life you go away from the Lord, and you, you, take, you take all the pleasures of the world, that's a terrible, terrible waste of a life. But let me tell you this, that God doesn't abandon you. You might abandon him, but he doesn't abandon you. And there's always a way back. Oh yes, you might go into a lot of shame, but there's always, always a way back. Always. And that's the great thing in life. You may know and I know of people that have just gone away from the Lord. Listen, you need to get on your knees and pray them back. I've just started this little society called the One by One Band. Get on your knees and pray for that one to come back. Fast. Pray, pray, and pray, and pray. Do whatever you like. You may not even tell them you're praying, but just pray them back. And then there'll be a day of rejoicing. Then there'll be a day that you will not be able to forget the rest of your life when they come back. That's the point. Verse 6. He says, I trust that you realise that we haven't turned away from living for Christ. <laughs> you see the people at Corinth you know they would say this they say oh take no notice of Paul he's just away from the Lord he's gone off the track he's gone off into some track of grace of God what on earth is that there was a time in Paul's life in which most of the Christians that he led to the Lord didn't talk to him anymore they thought he'd lost it in fact, all these churches he established at the beginning of his first and second missionary journey didn't let him come back and preach anymore. That's shocking, isn't it? 
They all thought he'd lost it. They all thought he'd gone off the track. No, Paul was on the right track. That's the point. They just didn't understand the track he was on. Peter, in his letter, says, Our brother Paul, he writes scriptures, and quite frankly, we don't understand what he's talking about. Peter even thought he'd gone off the track. Had, had Paul gone off the track? No, no. Paul was on the track, but Peter hadn't got on the track yet. That's the problem. That's the problem. Now, verse 7, Now I pray to God that you do no evil. Not that we should appear approved, but that which should, should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. Let me explain that. Some of, these, some of these phrases are just a little bit tricky, aren't they? He says, my prayer to God is that you do no evil. Now, let me just say something. Let me just say something. He's talking to Christians here. Got it? Just let that sink in a minute. He's talking to Christians and he says, I pray to God that you don't do evil. He said, well, I didn't know Christians could do that. No, I'm afraid, sadly, they can. So those of you that are men, you remain faithful to your wife. Do I need to tell you that? I should hope I never need to tell you that. Sadly, I'm afraid, I do have to tell you that. You that are women, don't look at other men. Do I need to tell you that? I shouldn't have to. But that's what you've got to do. You women, you keep your hand in your pocket when you're in a shop. This stuff is not yours unless you pay for it. You men, when you're at work, you can't just take stuff home. It isn't for free. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your boss. Your boss paid for every bit of it. You that are on your way home from school, when you go in the local shoe sweet shop, it's not yours until you pay for it. Okay? You may be a Christian, but don't do what's evil. Just don't do it. And don't just live your life so that other people will think, oh, isn't he wonderful? Don't live your life to be seen by men. Live your life honest before God. Because even if the shopkeeper doesn't see it, God sees it. That's the point. And you may say, oh, well, I've got this friendship with this lady. Uh, let me just say something. The church may not see it, but God sees it all. He says you need to have a life of holiness. You need to have a life that is a reflection of what you believe. You believe in the Ten Commandments, we could say. Well, if you believe in the Ten Commandments, then live it. You say that, you, that nobody should steal anything. Well, then don't steal. You say, of course, you know, it's a terrible thing when people commit adultery. Well, then don't do it then. You say it's a terrible thing to stand up in court and lie. Well, then don't tell untruths then. And he says, in spite of what you think about us, he says, we live a life that's holy before God. We have not forsaken Christ. We have not left the faith. We stand before God and we open our hearts before the Lord and say, Lord God, show me anything in my life that's wrong and I'll put it right. Now that's an honest conscience. Do you know, those of you that have never done that, I suggest you go home and do it. Make some time alone. Get alone with the Lord. And say, Lord, I want you to now, I said, I've come before you today by myself and I want you now to tell me what I've done wrong. Do you know what? I have never done that. I've done that many times in my life. I've never done that ever without the Lord saying, well, there's this thing, first of all. And I thought, wow, where did the, where, how did I miss that? How come I've carried on for weeks and months and not even, I've forgotten about it. The Lord says, you need to put that right. And when I've put the matter right, the Lord says, right, there's something else. I remember listening to the story of a young man who did that. He came before the Lord and he said, Lord, I need you to tell me anything I've done wrong. He said, I got a piece of paper. He said, I filled both sides of it. Until in the end I said, Lord, is there anything else that you need to tell me about in my life? And nothing could be remembered. He said it took him all day the next day to go round to all the people and make the apologies and put matters right to everybody on the list. 
He said, but when I'd done that, he said the release of joy was indescribable. Suddenly, the peace of God flooded his heart like he'd never experienced it ever in his life before. And that is what Paul lived like every day. Did Paul ever make mistakes? Oh, of course he did. But then he had lots of regular times with the Lord like this that put matters right. Verse 8, he says, we live in sincerity. That's what it means. We live for the truth. And of course, when we say we live in sincerity, what it means is this. Is that my life is what you see of my life is how it really is. That's what sincerity means. Now, I don't know how many of us can stand up to that sort of scrutiny. Can we? Can we do that? Can we live a life in front of one another in which I don't have to hide anything? Do I live a life before you and do you live a life before me and your fellow believers in which there's certain things you'd never say because if you said those things, they'd never talk to you again? Wow, what a, what a, what a life is like that. Paul says, he says, I live completely sincere before you. <coughs> right? We live for the truth. We live for the truth. Wow. Verse 9. For we are glad when we are weak, you are strong. Amen. And this also we wish, even your perfection. Now I struggled over this word. What's it mean? The word perfection is used lots of times in the New Testament, but it's used in different ways. What does it mean here? Well, first of all, he says in the, in the early part, he says, we're very glad when we are weak and when you are strong. But we'll come off that. He says, we want you to go on in your Christian life unto perfection. Now the Methodists, God bless him, John Wesley, great, great man of God, I think he slipped up over this verse and a few other verses. He had this idea that you could become the perfect person in the world. Um, Charles Haddon Spurgeon had one of his students in the Bible College who believed that he'd reach a state of perfection in which he never sinned anymore. And so, I don't know whether you know this, but Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who had a hand in building this church, not this one, but the previous, um, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a practical joker. Did you know that? He was a practical joker. And on one occasion, he was hiding behind the door when all the students were coming in, and he had a big jug full of water with ice in it. And when this student came in who said that he reached a state of perfection, as he came through the door, he poured it right over his head. He said, and then we had a demonstration of the flesh. Then we had a demonstration of the flesh. He said, the man got very angry. Very angry. And Spurgeon said, oh, I thought you've reached the point in which you don't ever get angry. Oh, no, no, no. Suddenly he'd got anger, all right. Suddenly he was drenched through in freezing cold water. He wasn't very happy at all. He was cross, fuming. But what Spurgeon had done is exposed. He'd exposed the lie that he was now perfect. All right, so there's no such thing as sinless perfection. Right, so what does perfection mean then? He says this. He says, I want your profession of faith, because you make a, a statement that you're a Christian, to become an actual reality in your life. In other words, I want you to have integrity. Wow. Now we hear a lot about integrity. And I used to struggle of what the word means. Anybody know what does integrity mean? Think of a definition? Character. That's part, yes. Anything else? Constrained by the love of Jesus. That's a good one, yes. That's true as well. That's very true. Integrity. I'll tell you what it means. It means to be integral. You say, well, we may be even more confused now. What I mean by this is this. It means that everything in your life is consistent with everything else. That's called integral. Everything is part of everything else. There's nothing inconsistent. So, for example, your Christian life is an integral part of everything that you think and everything that you do. 
That's what integrity means. It means that there's nothing in your life, nothing in your life that contradicts what you say. Got that? It means that when you say, yes, I'm a Christian, there's never a time when you turn around and have to pretend you're not. <coughs> have you ever had that moment when you take your Christian badge off, put it in your pocket and think, oh dear, hope they didn't notice that. Hope they didn't hear that. Hope they didn't see what I just did. That's not integrity. Integrity is when you never have to do this and when you live your life before the Lord and everything that you're doing is consistent with what you say and consistent with what you believe. That's the challenge. That is a big challenge. I recommend to people, by the way, that they always wear a badge as some indication that you're a Christian. Why, does that, why is that important, you say? Because it puts you on the spot. It means that when it says, I am a Christian, people say, well, you didn't act very Christian-like then. You think, oh dear. Oh dear. Integrity, then, is when your Christian life is consistent with your Christian beliefs. <coughs> That's integrity. He says, I want your life to be consistent throughout. Verse 10, therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present I will need to use sharpness, according to the power which the Lord has given me, to build you up and not to destroy you. He says, I don't want to have to come and bring the judgments of God. He says, I don't want to have to come to Corinth and start meeting out the judgments of God. You see, let me just say something. The Apostle Paul at this particular time was still operating as an Apostle. And as an Apostle, okay, he was able to operate under the judgments of the Old Covenant. So what's that mean? Well, what that means is, under the Old Covenant, if you were good, God blessed you. If you were wicked, God judged you. Right? That's the Old Covenant. There were people at Corinth that were sick because of the judgment of God and there were people at Corinth that had died because of the judgment of God and Paul was able in the power of God to bring about the judgments of God upon the Christians at Corinth that wasn't anything to do with being a Christian that was to do with the old covenant Paul was still able to operate under that sphere he says I don't want to have to come to Corinth and start meeting out the judgments of God upon you and then we have this beautiful little passage from verse 11 to the end which I call farewell and blessing I was very disconcerted that this particular translation had omitted the word farewell what a farewell means is this he says finally brethren farewell <laughs> you say well does that just mean goodbye no it doesn't mean that at all it means I hope and I pray that you will be well in body and in spirit and in mind and in heart. That's what I want for you. I want you to be well. And I want you to fare well. To be well. And then in, and then in the next sentence he says. Be perfect. Be. Have. Integrity. That's what he means. Be of good comfort. Okay. Be cheered. Be of one mind. And live in peace with one another. Because if you do all these things, these four things, then the God of love and peace will be with you. That's it. So he says, farewell. Have integrity. Have the joy of the Lord in your heart. And you only have that when you're right with the Lord. And walk in unity together. In verse 12 he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints here send their respects to you there. It's a proper letter, isn't it, this? And then lastly, he says, verse 14, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. That's his final farewell. All I can say is, praise the Lord. Now, I don't know whether you've noticed, like I've noticed, that this last chapter is very challenging. It's something that I think every Christian should really take to heart. You should be going home today. And you should be getting away with the Lord. And you should be saying, Lord, is my life consistent 
with what I say I believe? That's the great challenge that every single one of us face. So it's the great challenge I face. You know, is my life consistent with what I say? And that's the same for you.